Bravo 5 to Bravo Leader. Hang on, I'm coming in. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've always wanted to ride in one of these things. Hi, I'm Samuel L. Jackson. Many of cinema's most memorable moments have been created here at Industrial Light and Magic. Tonight, we'll take you behind the scenes at ILM so you can see how these groundbreaking artists create their incredible illusions. We'll take you to Toontown and Jurassic Park. We'll meet an outrageous alien and a terrifying Terminator. And we'll go to the set of Star Wars, Episode 1, Phantom Menace, where special effects boundaries were shattered for the latest installment of the Star Wars saga. Where are we going? Don't worry. The Force will guide us. So join me for this special tribute to George Lucas's industrial light and magic, where the only limit is the human imagination. Make your move. Make your move. Come on. <laughs> the double-bladed lightsaber. When you absolutely, positively got to kill every droid in the room, except no substitutes. These were used in just a few of the 2,000 visual effects shots seen in Star Wars The Phantom Menace. We're going to pay a visit to the set now so you can see just how they pulled it off. But first, I'm going to do some damage. And action! When production began on Star Wars Episode I in 1997, director George Lucas was finally ready to create the intergalactic epic he had always imagined. From this angle of him and everything, it's all 100% CG. Armed with an unprecedented arsenal of visual effects tools, Lucas undertook the monumental project that would feature an underwater city, a deep space demolition derby, and more than a thousand digitally created characters. Let him take that back, huh? Let will find what you need. <laughs> My original vision for Star Wars was to, to have a film that had spaceships and had creatures and had all kinds of fantastic uh, things going on in it, but the uh, ability to create those things was extremely limited. So I waited really until we had perfected the digital technology we needed so I could have a story that was more like the one that I could think of in my head. If anyone could bring Lucas's grand vision to life, it would be his own special effects dream factory, Industrial Light and Magic. Over the past two decades, ILM had changed the face of cinema, capturing 14 Academy Awards. Lucas could have used them back in 1975 when he undertook the first Star Wars film with the visual effects equivalent of Stone Age 2. I got him! Great kid! Don't get cocky! I had a, an idea of a movie that involved a lot of special effects, a lot of ships flying around in ways that, that uh, nobody had ever seen before. I went around and looked for a special effects company uh, or, and or a special effects department in a studio, and they were all gone. I can't shake it! To make matters more complicated, Lucas was having trouble convincing people that audiences were ready for his fantastical vision. So I'm picturing the stuff that I'd seen, you know, on Saturday afternoons on TV, you know, where you could literally see the wires holding up the obviously plastic or cardboard spaceship kind of going. <laughs> I said, oh, really? You want to do that? I thought it was a terrible idea. I mean, it just sounded dopey to me. I hired a bunch of college students and we really invented a whole different way of looking at special effects and started a special effects company at a time in the film business where special effects I didn't exist. I heard that George Lucas, who I'd never met, was doing a big space film called Star Wars. And I thought, you know, I think I'll try to get on this film and at least see what a big movie is like, a big effects film, and then 
It'll probably never happen again. We were reading it and just laughing our heads off because we thought, oh, nobody's going to make this thing. I mean, it's so big and complicated. It's the kind of script we all wanted to do, but we just never had the nerve to even try and sell it to a studio. We thought nothing would come of it. Armed with a paltry $3.5 million budget, Lucas went into production and his effects team pitched their tent in an old warehouse in Van Nuys, California. We were all relatively young then and uh, full of, uh, you know, vim and vigor and ready to try anything. And George also was great at just inspiring us to try all these different things. As soon as you came up with something that was different or a new way of looking at it, everybody's eyes just lit up and, you know, wanted to go even further. Three quarters of the crew uh, had never worked on a feature film before. The average age was about 26 and it just sounded like a very really cool thing to do. I got a phone call from a friend of mine and said, could you draw spaceships? Sure, no problem, yeah. The way ILM photographed those spaceships changed special effects forever. Traditionally, models were filmed by moving them in front of a stationary camera, but the Star Wars team moved a computer-controlled camera around the models, a process that became known as motion control. Motion control allowed George Lucas and, and the people at Industrial Light and Magic to uh, create a lot of motion and activity in a, in a shot that, that normally would have been static. He showed us uh, some footage from a World War II film or documentary footage showing a maneuver that a couple of fighter planes were doing that we had to turn into X-wings doing those maneuvers. And he wanted to, in a sense, create it in, in sort of a documentary style, as if you actually had a cameraman in there in the action, shooting it from another airplane that was going by or another spaceship that was going by. Meanwhile, the cast wasn't exactly convinced that the effects team had perfected this new technology. No. Um, I had the sense that it was, uh, that it was a pretty rough craft at that, at that point. I mean, there were very, they were very clear about what they could do and, and um, how to do it. But for the actors, it was pretty simple. It was just a matter of imagining what really wasn't there and reacting to it. Come out of hyperspace into a meteor shower, some kind of asteroid collision. Not on any of the charts. When the film was complete, Lucas and ILM had created a milestone work that silenced doubters and became an international phenomenon. From the first frame, you know, completely transported in, in a way, you know, that, that I'd really never been before. Left the theater, and looked back up at the marquee and I just said, we gotta see it again. It was such a quantum step beyond anything that anybody had ever seen before, you know. It was tremendously exciting. I got really energized by it. In fact, I sort of quit my job as a truck driver and said, well, if I'm gonna do this, I better get, you know, I better get going. Don't track yourselves in, I'm gonna make the jump to light speed. The film was far more effective than I'd anticipated on the level of special effects. And that was clear from the opening frames that this was a lot more than three goofballs and a guy in a monkey suit. There was a substantial dramatic element here that was supplied by the special effects. It's really the, the, the filmmaker and the storyteller and how well they're able to tell the story that counts in the end. The technology is used to tell a story and that's the whole point. When Lucas began work on The Empire Strikes Back, he opened ILM's doors to fellow filmmakers such as Steven Spielberg, James Cameron, Robert Zemeckis, and Ron Howard. His company then began a two-decade Oscar-winning rampage, leaving creative and technical boundaries, as well as box office records, in their way. Coming up, ILM's magicians conjure up episode one's Feed City. Jurassic Park's digital dinosaurs, and a groundbreaking desert drag race that's out of this world. Long before scenes like this make it to the screen, they're designed by visual effects art directors. Sketches, paintings, and storyboards are created to envision spectacular cities, incredible creatures, and breathtaking battle scenes. Even in the midst of a digital revolution, these artists prove that the pen, paintbrush, and imagination can still be the most powerful tools of all. What a 
piece of junk. So make point five past light speed. When George Lucas undertook the original Star Wars, he asked illustrator Ralph McQuarrie to create images of his long ago faraway galaxy. Almost a quarter century later, conceptual design continues to be an integral part of ILM's visual effects philosophy. I think in many ways, having an art department that focuses on pre-production and all of these design issues is what differentiates a lot of our work from the work of others. We try to be involved from the first day to the very last day. And that influence and that, that working together and that synergy, I think, really leads to the best results on the screen. After my first meeting with the ILM gang, I was exhilarated because I realized that these were folks who could talk very creatively and find ways to translate what it was you were talking about into reality. Director Ron Howard first worked with ILM on his 1985 hit, Cocoon. It's hard to know who to trust, isn't it, Jack? The big challenge there was in trying to create the aliens, the Antarians. And these were going to be genuine characters that you'd be spending some time with on screen, not just a fleeting image here and there. But there were, you know, there were real moments. So there were death scenes. They were genuine characters. While ILM depends heavily on pre-production design, when working with some directors like Steven Spielberg, they know they must be prepared to deviate from their carefully laid plans. One of the nice things about him is he's very uh, inspirational when he gets out in the location. He gets all excited about it, and he sort of, you know, says, "Hey, can I do something like this?" And it's an idea that had never been storyboarded, an idea that we've never even known. But it's such a great idea that you just sort of like want to try it. I like to be able to, you know, get on a location and react to what's happening around me because I can storyboard all my movies, which I often have. But um, when I get the location, sometimes I get 10 more ideas. And an effects guy needs to be flexible in order to allow me the chance to make up some stuff that I didn't think about four months earlier. The only thing that helps us to push the envelope is the client coming to us with an idea which has never been done before. And that very element is what helps us to continue to perfect and enhance our ability to produce the effects that we do. As their visual effects imagery has become more layered and complex, ILM has begun to use animated storyboards known as animatics to communicate their ideas. We're doing more and more animatics, which are basically moving storyboards. So not only do you have a, a framing of a scene or a depiction of what's happening in the scene, but actually the movement and the timing of it as well. One of ILM's early animatic efforts was for the memorable speeder bike chase in Return of the Jedi. When we did Jedi, we had a hundred drawings of the sequence that takes place in like three minutes. We thought about trying an animatic, so we did it with little Ken and Barbie dolls. And on this little set that was like four feet wide and eight feet long, I could lay out the entire hundred shots of the speeder bike sequence. Since they spend their days creating fantastical worlds and incredible creatures, it's no wonder the ILM artists are a little different from the rest of us. I think certain eccentricities are part of the character makeup. Uh, and I think you can really understand that when you go into their little workstations and you look around at all the art and, and fetish icon they have hanging up on their cork boards and taped to the sides of their, of their, of their, of their workstations, you know, and, and, and then you see that some of these guys are, girls are really weird, but, um, but, but weird in a bohemian way, you know. They're all very calm, but they're all discussing the most mind-boggling concepts. I used to sit in the canteen there and just listen to them. They were amazing. Got, we've got these machined aluminum joints up here in the shoulder. Right. To do what they've done and to rise to the level of, that they have, 
I'm sure, like good actors or like anybody else, they've immersed themselves in a very particular world. Yeah, we, we can put like a little walkway between them. But the okay. next one. When George Lucas was ready to return to the Star Wars world, he worked with concept designer Doug Chang to create the new film's diverse planets and eccentric characters. <laughs> one of their greatest challenges was the lavishly imagined Naboo City of Thebes. Thede City was actually uh, the first location that we tackled, and it was the world that set the design aesthetics for episode one. It was wonderful because it, it gave us an excuse to create a different design aesthetics, different from the original Star Wars, while still being in the Star Wars universe. I wanted to create something that had a kind of uh, Mediterranean feel, something that Victorian and romantic in nature, uh, in, in, in the fact that the Victorians liked to paint ancient Rome and, and other antiquities with a very, very romantic afternoon light, uh, and I wanted a, a whole city and world that looked like that. The Eid City, we approached as being a physical model, a miniature at 1 30th scale. It was important for them to provide us fairly detailed uh, types of drawings and sketches so that we could go ahead and design and uh, plan the effects uh, and knowing exactly what they wanted to achieve on the screen. To bring the Thede City model to life, the effects team added computer-generated birds and miniature waterfalls, which were made from a top-secret ILM formula. We ended up shooting uh, basically salt, uh, dumping down like 14 feet from a, a ramp on black, so that what you see as the waterfalls in all those scenes was just falling salt. Each shot in itself is almost a little story because everything uh, that goes into a shot needs to be figured out. You know, it's very much like uh, architecture in a way. It's, you really have to understand what the whole building's gonna look like before you start putting the pieces together. Next, we'll learn the secrets behind ILM's digital creatures, from the T-Rex and the Terminator to the incredible Jar Jar from episode one. In recent years, industrial light and magic has used their considerable resources to bring to life an impressive menagerie of computer-generated characters. Star Wars Episode I takes this technology a giant leap forward with several animated actors who seamlessly interact with their human counterparts. What, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? I'm here in the Naboo Swamp, where a friend of mine has promised to show us how ILM conjures up these incredible creations. Look out! You saved my again! Jar Jar, you okay? Uh-huh. Want to show us how you were created? Uh, on second thought, no. Not really, no, no. Hey, you promised. Don't make me get medieval on you. Ah, uh, your support is well seen. This way, hurry! Phantom Menace is really the first time we've been able to create photorealistic uh, characters that do act, that are completely created digitally. Uh, I don't really think there's any other film that has done this yet. The scope of the film is so huge in relationship to digital characters. We have Obviously, we have Jar Jar Binks, who plays a major role in the film. We have Watto, who plays a substantial role. And then we have virtually hundreds and hundreds of characters that are in the background. The groundwork for digital characters like Jar Jar and Watto was laid by visual effects legend Ray Harryhausen, who was a master of the stop-motion animation technique. We chose stories like uh, Jason and Sinbad, uh, in order to put on the screen something different. And we had to use every trick of the trade that was available at that time. You couldn't go back and refine it the way you can today with a computer. That's what we grew up with, and we never considered it a difficult problem. It was a problem to solve. Early efforts in computer animation were made by Lucasfilm's Pixar Group, which would later form a new company and create such films as Toy Story. Hello? Dennis Muren from ILM came to us and said, you know, we're doing effects for this new film, Young Sherlock Holmes, and there's one effect that, frankly, we don't know how to do. 
And it's a stained glass window where there's a knight in it. And the knight is supposed to jump out and menace this old priest. So it was the first effect done with computer animation that was so perfectly blended with the scene. People didn't know how it was done. And that really opened the door for, for using computers in special effects. The effect was so successful that ILM convinced director Ron Howard to use their computers for the difficult transformation scene in Willow. You know, I assumed it was going to be sort of your basic clunky, some dissolves, uh, maybe something we could do with a couple of puppets. But Dennis Murin kept coming in and saying, you know, I think there's a thing we can do with computers. And I said, what do you mean like a dissolve? He said, well, no, it won't be dissolved. It'll be, you know, a real blending. You know, the term morph hadn't, hadn't uh, occurred yet. ILM next undertook Goodbye. the complicated water tentacle or pseudopod sequence from the abyss. I think it was 16 or 18 shots, something like that. Nothing uh, that would overwhelm everybody. But, you know, those 16 shots took, I think, nine months. And boy, did we just, we agonized over every detail. It was a perfect opportunity. And Jim, I think he had it in the back of his mind that if it didn't work, he could cut the sequence out of the film. But fortunately, we managed to, you know, to pull it off. It was a whole other order of magnitude when we did T2. And you have the, the nemesis of the film uh, is entirely predicated on these effects working. Terminator 2, Judgment Day, upped the stakes considerably by adding ILM's artistry to Robert Patrick's menacing performance. Get out. We didn't want him to be robotic. We wanted him to have a liveness and a fluidity that then had to translate into the animation. So Robert and I worked on his physical performance, his looks, his mannerisms. Then he got sort of abducted by ILM and they, they took him up there to some secret laboratory where they put a grid all over his body and had him, you know, had him recreate the character for them. But it was pretty extensive, and it was also embarrassing. You're out there in your bikini briefs and, uh, or a pair of nudo underwear that they gave me or something and a skull cap, and you've got these three-inch squares all over you, and you, you know, you're sitting there kind of going like, wow, this is really a trip. <laughs> they really included me. I mean, it wasn't just about the technology, and there was a realization that we can't do this without you, and you felt like you were a part of a team that way. I think that's the great moment in, in the course of any visual effects project where you take that kind of leap of faith that you have a good enough team that you've done the steps up to that point that allow you to project the trajectory of your technology to the next level. Jurassic Park and its sequel, The Lost World, took the Terminator technology even further by adding such elusive qualities as realistic skin textures, lifelike muscle movements, and animal behavior. I, I think the pivotal moment in, in uh, the development of digital technology in film was Jurassic Park. When we were able to create a dinosaur that moved realistically, that could, could be put into the film and look real, we'd achieved that level that we needed in order to create what one might describe as digital cinema. To convince director Steven Spielberg they could create the film's dinosaurs with computer graphics, Dennis Murin and his team created this test footage. When he brought the test out to show me, I said, Jurassic Park is going to be great. I mean, it's going to be, at least effects-wise, it's going to be Amazing. People are going to really believe the dinosaurs are walking the earth today. Each dinosaur had its own character, and so we had to really get into animation, how we were going to communicate this behavior on the screen. they got to have intent behind their eyes. These are not monsters. They're living animals. Like Frankenstein, they take from nothing, you know, uh, and, and something inanimate, and they make it into a, for all the world, create the illusion of something live and living. It's an amazing thing. I think that's what's so exciting about using this medium of computer animation. The audience knows it doesn't exist, but you can use the computer tools to make it look absolutely believable. 
And that's what ILM continues to do, and it astounds us all. ILM's most astounding characters to date are the scene-stealing synthespians that populate Star Wars Episode One. I mean, five years ago, we would not have been able to bring Jar Jar to the life like we have. We could not do clothing. We could not make the wind blow his ears. We couldn't do the numbers of characters we're putting on the screen at the same time. And there's no way we would have been able to get it done in the time period. Each of Jar Jar's 323 shots had to be carefully planned and choreographed by an ILM team headed up by effects supervisor John Knoll. The president should focus, stay just on Liam. Lucas made these difficult scenes more comfortable for his human cast by bringing Ahmed Best, the voice of Jar Jar, to the London set. It wouldn't have really worked too well if there wasn't somebody there acting, you know, whether or not I was in the suit or not. If, it, it's a lot harder to um, react to air than it is to react to somebody giving you something. I like to use stand-in characters, use the actors who are going to play the digital parts, uh, be on the set, say their lines, and interact with the live actors. George would shoot a sequence with Ahmed in the scene, acting and interacting, and he, once the actors were comfortable with that, he would then remove Ahmed and shoot some clean versions, meaning Jar Jar Ahmed wasn't there, so that we had room to put our character in there. Misa hating crunching. That's the last thing Misa wanted. Once each scene was filmed, ILM's animators began their work on the computer-generated performances. It was really important for them to get in the head of the character. It, they really had to understand Jar Jar, and some of them who were confused a lot of the time didn't have a problem getting into Jar Jar's head because uh, he was confused most of the movie. The visual effects team used a series of character animation tools and lip sync reference materials to infuse Jar Jar with dead on accurate dialogue and dynamic physical behaviors. Now that I had a character who was free to run and jump and have expression and, and act, there was a certain exuberance that I knew was going to be tied to that character, just in my own exuberance of being able to have a character free enough to do things with. God, what's Amisa saying? Ultimately, what makes these characters so memorable is not special effects trickery, but character quirks and emotional resonance. As effects artists move into the realm of the actor, these are the qualities which will prove most challenging and rewarding. When we're getting into characters, we're actually giving emotions to, in different levels to the work than we've done before, more complicated emotions. And I think that's more like what's at the, at the heart of storytelling. Coming up, a twisted look at some of ILM's most outrageous effects. And a ride inside the cockpit of the Terminal Velocity Episode 1 pod race. This would be Meryl Streep's final scene in most movies. But industrial light and magic doesn't let a little thing like death get in the way. You pushed me down the stairs. With 14 Oscars to their credit, the artists at ILM have proven that for them, nothing is impossible. Whether a script calls for human contortions, alien life forms, or rampaging dinosaurs, They'll use their creative ingenuity to thrill and amaze us. Hey, put my butt back where it belongs. <laughs> While ILM's work with digital characters has been revolutionary, many of their other efforts have been downright shocking. Some of their most bizarre effects were seen in the 1992 black comedy, Death Becomes Her. <gasps> yes! I approached the illusion in, in Death Becomes Her from a strictly, from a storytelling point of view. I mean, I, I presented the screenplay to the effects team, and I you know, said, here's what I'd like to see. Just look at me. I'm soaking wet. Doing a human being is a lot more complicated than uh, anything. And it's just because we are so familiar with each other and how we all move and look and how we behave. My ass. I can see my ass. And there is 
there's something really wrong with your neck, too. I mean, this is Meryl Streep we're talking about. I think she probably does a better job of it than we'll ever do. And so we wound up shooting her face, as, you, know, you know, with the blue screen of her head and then shooting her body on the set. That was wild because we had to come in on one day and shoot the scene. <laughs> it had to be the day my mother was visiting the set. So I was trying to explain this to her. She said, why the hell do you have a bag over your head? I come to watch you, they pay you all this money, you're acting with a bag over your head. And I said, well, Bob says it will all go together. I just have to make a telephone call. Oh, no. In Forrest Gump, ILM used their human-altering wizardry to even more dramatic effect when they digitally removed the legs of star Gary Sinise for more than half the film. Forrest Gump was different only because that it asked the effects to bring a lot more uh, emotional uh, resonance, essentially, as the rest of the movie was, was trying to do. It wasn't trying to blow you out of your seat, you know, with some real flashy, you know, trickery. It was trying to do, in a lot of cases, incredibly subtle work that might just alter a scene's, you know, tone just a little bit to match more of the director's original intent. Forrest Gump! <laughs> While computers have helped ILM in recent years, the amazing Who Framed Roger Rabbit was completed in the pre-digital dark ages of special effects. Photographic tricks and mechanical effects were used to combine the film's live action and animated worlds. Gee, Pathetti, I was thrilled. You saved my life. How can I ever repay you? My overall goal in Roger Rabbit was to make sure that the audience completely forgot that they were watching spectacular special effects, that they would be just completely involved in the emotional story of this rabbit. Hi, Eddie. <laughs> the one thing that does sell a created character as being in the scene is if they move objects around and have interaction with a human and so forth. The film's technical demands often required star Bob Hoskins to alter his performance to accommodate the demands of his animated co-star. If I grab the rabbit like that, right, I've just cost the company a hundred grand because they've got to paint the rabbit through my fingers, right, on celluloid with tiny little paintbrushes. If I grab him like that, it's clean. Now that you're in this, Bob, you know, I guess we're committed to shooting this. I hope you went to the bathroom. There's one scene where I had this uh, sort of cage you know, inside of a uh, raincoat that moved in different ways and sort of, you know, things came out. But tell me, Eddie, is that a rabbit in your pocket or you just happy to see me? Tying Roger Rabbit into a scene is one thing, but when ILM was asked to create a 42-foot mythical beast for Dragonheart, they had to go to even greater lengths. There were a number of things in Dragonheart that we used to try to tie the dragon into the actual scene. The scenes where he dives into the water, I had them construct uh, some large 55-gallon uh, drums that they welded together and dropped from a helicopter, so we got the correct splash. After each scene featuring the dragon was photographed on location, the ILM animators would create the performance. Obviously, it was very large, uh, for being an actor in the scene, but he was an actor nonetheless, so it, it required the full range of emotions for animating. In films like Dragonheart and Ron Howard's Willow, the actors faced the difficult task of reacting to special effects co-stars that don't yet exist. When you're directing a scene like this, you find yourself, you know, standing up on a 25 or 30 foot ladder screaming, you know, and now here's the dragon, he's, bl he's blowing fire, it's fire. Hey, hey. Can you imagine what would happen if you really saw a dinosaur? You have to fall short in the acting somehow, don't you? you must go faster. Because really, if that happened to you, you'd go, oh, I better act that again, I better go back and do those movies, because it's nothing like what really happens. In the hit comedy Men in Black, star Will Smith had to envision an even more outrageous co-star when he had a close encounter with one of ILM's creations. 
There's only one way off of this planet, baby, and that's through me. The large alien uh, at the end of the movie, Edgar, um, was completely computer generated because the physics involved in making a puppet that could actually be as dynamic as we needed in the scene to fight with Will Smith um, really wasn't possible. So I filmed Will Smith jumping onto a blue substitute for the character as the first piece of film that we shot, and then we animated the alien character to fit into what Will was grabbing onto. I have no idea how they do that stuff. ILM is just, they, they just do amazing special effects, and it's, but it looks fleshy, and it's from a computer. We've reached a point collectively where the only limitation is your imagination. If you can afford it and you can think of it, you can do it. There is nothing that cannot be imagined and then visualized by these artists. They really believe that nothing is impossible. Coming up, ILM goes beyond the impossible when the Tatooine pod race gives them a crash course in digital destruction. One of the most exciting scenes in Star Wars The Phantom Menace is the high-octane pod race on Tatooine. The race took nearly two years to film and includes an incredible 320 visual effects shots, making it one of the most complicated scenes in motion picture history. For the first time, here are the secrets behind this spectacular interstellar hot rod rally. young cars were very important to me speed and and racing became an extreme fascination for me from the age of about 13 on in the phantom menace i had the opportunity to create what i would call the ultimate race To plan the 500 mile per hour race, an elaborate animatic was created illustrating each shot in the scene. The finished test footage projected the difficult high velocity sequence in an action packed moving storyboard. Film is inherently uh, a moving medium and storyboards don't express that fully. So especially in the example of the pod race, we decided to create these computer generated animatics to put the storyboards in motion. They edited the whole thing together, got a really good idea of the, of the timing and pace and, and the speeds that were involved and exactly what shots were necessary to tell the story. And that was tremendously useful to us. I mean, a lot of our shots are direct duplicates of the animatics. What the Ooh, there goes Quadraneros power coupling. And then you look up and you pull back and you realize that you're... Production of the pod race began on a London soundstage. And you're coming out the other side, Jay. This is where the Tuscans shoot you. Be careful. Anakin Skywalker, played by Jake Lloyd, was filmed against a neutral green screen background with motion provided by the onset crew. Climb through the canyon, Jake. Climb through the canyon. But uh, these shapes, you can be... Back at ILM, the effects team created the treacherous background terrains seen throughout the 500 mile race. We knew we could shoot everything on a helicopter and we could go to various different locations to try and create the whole uh, uh, arena of where we were going to shoot. But as the storyboards became more and more real, John Knoll turned to me and he said, you know, I think I can do this all in computer graphics. It's desert terrain that doesn't really exist anywhere in the world. And the speed that we're traveling, we couldn't really set up a big model. The only real solution we had was to do the terrains that computer generated. In addition to the backgrounds, ILM also had to fabricate Anakin's racing rivals and their outlandish vehicles. Every pod is completely different. There are no shared parts between them. The idea is that a lot of these were supposed to be kind of hand tinkered together in, uh, in backyards. Some of them are more well-funded racing teams, but they're all really different. And we tried to, to make them all fly a little bit different. 
we only used real tangible uh, models for when they were stationary and they were used in a couple of shots on the again stationary on the starting grid but everything else that's in motion was a computer graphic version of each of those engines and pods the most dramatic shots in the scene are the high-speed end-over-end bone-jarring crashes endured by the more unfortunate competitors <laughs> Logistically, it became such an expensive appearing nightmare that John decided to try and see what we could do in computer graphics, and um, I think the results are amazing. The effects team used realistic computer simulations to create the dynamic Formula One style crashes. It's not a lot of flame, that's not really what it's about. It's about inertia. These things hit and they just sort of keep going and going, and parts shred off of them and they tumble. And Pieces go everywhere. When Anakin triumphantly crosses the finish line, he is greeted by an elated crowd of onlookers who cheer his victory. The crowds are going nuts. In reality, this was a scale miniature housing an elated throng of more than 350,000 Q-tips. For at least four big shots, it was easier and it worked perfectly fine to leave the Q-tips in and filling the stands with 350,000 race goers that uh, had a former life as a, as a cotton swab. The pod race was not only a victory for young Anakin, but for ILM as well. This 10 minutes of fury is a hot rodder's fantasy and a special effects tour de force. Coming up, George Lucas reveals what to expect from the next Star Wars movie and a final look at ILM's greatest moments. For nearly 25 years, industrial light and magic has captivated audiences with their unique blend of groundbreaking technology and dazzling creative artistry some of their most exciting work may still be ahead of them. In the future, we expect to diversify into doing digital feature animation. We will hopefully be doing projects that are created completely in the computers. You know, I think given enough time and money, you can, you can do probably just about anything. I think we could do a person. ILM will continue to explore new territory, but don't look for the next Star Wars film to be driven by special effects. You're a funny little boy. The next film ultimately is a love story. It'll still have some digital characters. Uh, Jar Jar will probably be back, but it's not going to expand the state of the art. I'm simply going to continue to tell the story and using those tools. While Star Wars will forever be ILM's legacy, their impressive and diverse body of work transcends any single project. They have become an unparalleled artistic entity, ready to infuse any film with creative firepower. I'm extremely proud of ILM. I'm extremely proud of what they've accomplished. All I've done is tried to give them the guidance that has allowed them to work and prosper and to develop their creativity. ILM has their own identity, and it's a wonderful identity, and they've done so many different subjects that have made an impression on the screen and obviously on the audience. And the beauty of ILM is that it's done so many productions, and so many of them have been groundbreaking that there's a, a technological culture there that, that is beyond the individuals who made those advancements. It's always going to come back to story and character and creating an experience, but how people watch it and what they can see is going to change and evolve, and if George has anything to do with it, I suspect ILM will be right at the center of all that. ILM has, has, has given a tremendous gift to the world, and especially to the world of you know, filmmaking and filmmakers. They have freed our imaginations, and they have allowed us to dream and be guaranteed that our dreams will come true on the screen. All units stand by in attack formation. I have to sign off now so I can strike down upon these Federation troops with great vengeance and furious anger. 
but I hope you have a new appreciation for all the challenging special effects work that goes on behind the scenes here at ILM. See you later, and may the Force be with you.